Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope this episode helps you identify and break your next growth barrier. And if you enjoy it, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you'll never miss a thing. Hey, whether it's staffing, budget, volunteers, or one of the many things that hold back churches, overcoming growth barriers is the key to progress. And if you're ready to break your next barrier, the Art of Leadership Academy is for you. Inside, you'll get access to all my on-demand church leadership courses, team trainings, coaching calls, but more importantly, you'll join a network of 1,500 high-capacity church leaders. Some will be right where you're at and some a little bit ahead, but everybody in the group is committed to leading a healthier, growing church and supporting each other. So if you want to fuel your mission, not just by consuming information, but by pairing it with people who will both challenge and support you, today's the day. You can learn more and start making progress by visiting theartofleadershipacademy.com. And also check out He Gets Us. Churches across the country are using resources from the He Gets Us campaign to give people new and creative ways to share Jesus' message of radical love. Go to hegetsuspartners.com slash carry, and you can sign up to get free resources like discussion guides, prayer guides, reading plans, and more. Now to today's episode. Sean, it's good to have you back on the podcast. So good to be back. So you and I um, just wrapped up doing a full course yeah. on pastoral succession. And I want to talk about pastoral succession. So let's start here. How big of an issue is pastoral succession in the church now? First of all, let's define what that is. Secondly, how big of an issue is it now? And then where is this going over the next decade? Yeah. So pastoral succession, in my opinion, is a huge issue. And it always has been, regardless of how many we see happening out there, these are always big turning points in the local church. If you look at the history of any local church, when you see the change of a senior leader, which we would call that succession, yeah. transition, those are always turning points in the church. Um, the cool thing is we've done some research and we see that those turning points actually lead to a healthier church, which is very encouraging. So that's a Can huge Can explain issue. that for a minute? Like what, what kind of research did you do? So CDF Capital commissioned a study with Barna, and Barna went out and did the research. Right. And it's actually a very complete study. We have access to it on our website and on the CDF Capital website. So it's available to anybody, to the public. But their findings early on were that as churches approached transition, only about 33% of these churches would be considered healthy and growing. Okay. And at the three-year point after the transition— 75% of the churches were considered healthy and growing. So it doubled the level of health and growth in a church when the old leader went and the new leader stepped in. Yep. Fascinating. Yeah, slightly Fascinating. more than double. So yeah, more than double, more yeah. than double. Yeah, Pardon which is enough. like, that's breathtaking, right? Okay. I hear that for, for a church to go from 33% of the churches to 75, uh, you have to pause and take note of that. Yeah. 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 So where is it now? And then what's going to happen in the next decade, over the next decade? Yeah. So in approximately the next decade, we have right now more than 50% of pastors that are over age 55. And of course, we can't predict when these leaders will decide to step down. But if we say it's roughly age 65, some may yeah. be longer, some may be shorter, and there'll also be some unplanned transitions where somebody right. moves on to another church or, or whatever the case may be. Um, what that means is about half the churches that we count in the U.S. would be about 340, maybe 320,000 churches will go through a succession or transition process. So 160, 160,000 churches are going to go through a transition in the next decade. Yeah. yeah. And you're right. The average age of, of a senior pastor is late 50s. Absolutely. So the math, the math is is not good on that. Uh, give us a little more. I mean, you know, we read your bio during the intro to the podcast, et cetera, et cetera. But you have been working hands on mm -hmm. with uh, incoming and outgoing pastors for a decade. Yep. T tell us about that. I don't, and I mean that quite sincerely. I don't think there is anybody in America, maybe even globally, who is as hyper focused on this issue as you are. Yeah, I think what I saw about a decade ago was there was a fair amount of energy being put into succession planning. Yeah. 
there were some books being written mm -hmm. and all of them were great. And actually when you read them in concert with one another, there's, there's half a dozen books out there. Some of them aren't just focused on the church, but some of them are, and they're great. But what I felt overwhelmingly was this burden that there's a lot being put into the succession planning process. People are seeing mathematically the need to address succession. Principle one, principle two, right. principle three. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I was seeing was there was a little bit of a feeling that after the baton pass had happened, everybody sort of went home and goes, we're glad that's over with. <laughs> But personally, I just happened to be in a position where there were a lot of friends of mine in ministry that were roughly age 35 to 40 or 45 in that area that were stepping into leadership. And after the baton pass, if they were honest, they would say, this doesn't feel like a normal season of leadership where mm -hmm. I've been prepared for ministry. This feels different. Um, I'm losing some confidence that I actually don't know what I'm doing but I'm scared to say that in this environment. And then they're hitting some challenges and some pitfalls and, and maybe even hidden potholes that they say, oh, I didn't really notice that until I got here. Wow. And I wish I would have saw that a little bit sooner. Hmm. Um, didn't see it coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there were just a set of unusual challenges. And because I was relationally connected with these people, I just had an increasing burden to say, wow, there's so much at stake for the church. Mm. And these leaders are carrying an inordinate burden of leadership, the mantle of leadership. I wonder if there's anything I can do. And so the first thing wasn't to bring content to the conversation because yeah. I was new to the, the conversation, but it was like, I wonder if I can connect these people with each other and with leaders that have maybe gone before them 10 or mm -hmm. 15 years and have lived out some of those transition seasons. And so I just started applying myself about 10 years ago to that journey. Yeah, and you have literally, do you know roughly how many leaders who are now incoming pastors? And obviously you work with people like me who are outgoing pastors, right? right? right. But how many incoming pastors you've worked with over the last decade, roughly ballpark? I stopped counting around 140. So that's sort of like detailed involvement with about 140. And leaders. by that, I mean, we've sat in this room mm -hmm. with some of those people yep. and we're talking about just, complete the circle right here. Like yep. you're doing life on life, six at a time, mm -hmm. 10 on a time, and you're giving them community with each other through mm -hmm. these cohorts. You're also bringing them to mentors. I've had the privilege of, of working with a few of those groups. Yep. You brought them, flown them here into Canada. We sat mm -hmm. in my backyard just behind us, you know, at the fire pit, cooked on the big green egg, but you've also brought them to NT Wright, mm -hmm. to Rich Velotis. Who are some of the other mentors that you've, you've, We've been Brought. we've been so blessed. The start mm -hmm. was really Judd Wilhite. And yeah. he just at Central just had this incredible story. Uh, Gene Apple was the leader that uh, preceded him, and Judd just has a great story there. Uh, both of them are incredible transitions leaders. But um, Judd Wilhite, um, Nikki Gumbel, which his leadership at, at HTB has been incredible, but his predecessor was, was Sandy Miller. Of course, they've now had a handoff there, yeah. which is, is uh, recent. Yeah. Um, he's now the HTB. outgoing. Yep, uh -huh. so he's now the outgoing. <laughs> um, Dave Stone. We, we've had so many. Brady Boyd. Uh, a lot of people go, oh, who's Brady Boyd? Well, Brady Boyd is actually the pastor that followed Ted Haggard. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people mm -hmm. are very familiar with that. And so there are so many different situations. And so we've been blessed to be invited into the homes of these leaders yeah. and really get the story behind the story. Yeah. And I think that's what brings these groups together is, oh, there's something there. But then what you find out over time is the most valuable thing that happens is the peer-to-peer -peer connection, is the support that the peers bring month after month as we do these gatherings. And the leaders that let us into their homes are exceptional, and there's no doubt about it that it's an essential ingredient. But what is so cool is to see the leaders lifting each other's arms up and putting wind into mm -hmm. each other's sails from a peer to peer. And I don't really know how that happens other than to say it just feels like God's ordained some of those things. And so we just keep at it. We just keep yeah. forming these groups and creating these environments where we have access to these leaders, the story behind the story. I always say leaders will tell you a story in their home or a different version of a story in their home than they will say anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's 
those details in those stories that are where the most learnings are. Yeah. And and what I like about it is it's, I mean, you've got polling data and all that stuff and that's good, but it is, these aren't like we flew in for two hours, met with NT Wright and flew home. These are like two or three day yeah. visits where you're over a couple of meals and the leaders are like, oh, you too. Mm-hmm. And they get to know each other. And I think it's incredible. And that's why I was excited to jump in on this project with you when we came up with the idea. I'm like, why, why don't we just do this together? Because I don't know anybody who's got the insights. And so what I want to do is I want to really focus in this conversation on the dynamics, Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you have your nice principles and everything like that, but there's just so many dynamics. So let's start with outgoing leaders. So for me, I led what became Conexus Church from 1995 to 2015, two Mm -hmm. decades. When I turned 50 in 2015, I decided it was time to hand things off to a guy a decade younger than me, Jeff Brody. Mm -hmm. That overall has gone incredibly well, Um, but it doesn't always go well. And it doesn't mean that we didn't have challenges along the way as well. So, you know, based on what you know, what you've studied, what you've read, and and the hundreds of leaders you've worked with, what are some of the challenges that outgoing leaders, people who have been in that, and I'm not talking about a pastor who was there for two months and left. I mean, somebody who's got 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years of credibility with a congregation. Mm -hmm. What are some of the issues for outgoing pastors that we would struggle with? Because... If the average pastor is 57, there's a lot of them listening to this podcast, as well as a lot of younger leaders going, when is that guy going to move on? Mm-hmm. So what are, what are the issues with the outgoing pastors? Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because I didn't start out thinking I was going to learn a lot about outgoing pastors because mm-hmm. I was surrounded by the incoming pastors. And uh, Mariner's Church in Southern California was being led by Kenton Bishore. Yeah. And Kenton came to me and said, as I'm preparing myself for transition, would you help me understand what incoming leaders are dealing with Hmm. that should have been handled by the outgoing leader? And such a great question. That's when I realized, like, yeah, that perspective of two a year in, two years in, five years in from an incoming leader to be able to humbly and open-handedly ask the question, what do you wish could have been done different? Just pick one thing, Mm -hmm. pick the the most important thing. And I realized there's some real valuable learning in here from that perspective. So I learned two things. One, that I was stewarding a lot of stories that could help people before transition, even though that wasn't my original intent. And two, I knew that leaders who were willing to learn like that early on and make changes were going to have the most successful transitions because Mm -hmm. they were willing to do things different for the sake of the church after they left. And so I think that's probably the key thing is number one is for an outgoing leader to understand this is probably gonna be harder and require more of you than you originally think. It's not just about finding a person who can follow you and choosing a date when that is going to occur, right? A who and a when. So it's going to be harder for the outgoing leader and require more than the outgoing leader assumes. Yeah. Which means they probably need to start a little sooner. Mm -hmm. Just, I think, with the emotional understanding, interviewing other people who have stepped out of leadership. Because when we're immersed in leadership, and I think that's probably one of the learnings is we're human and we make heroes out of our leaders. And that doesn't happen day one or day two or year one, but when you're there for a decade, when you're there for two decades, you've slowly become a a hero in some ways to the people in your organization and in your church. And to flip a switch one day and hand the baton and the title and the office to somebody else, um, that's a big change. Mm -hmm. It's happened slowly over years and decades, but it's a big change to transition out. And if you're not prepared for what that feels like, if you're not prepared to maybe be looking forward to things during that season, if all you have is what's in the rearview mirror in that moment, it can be very difficult. So let's go through that. Like it is an emotional journey. I definitely went through an emotional journey, both when I handed things over, but I stayed as teaching pastor with Jeff's blessing for four years, five years, Mm -hmm. and like decelerated to halftime in year five. And then now I'm no longer on the teaching team. I'll come back if invited, you know, but I think I preached four times in the last two years. So it's Mm -hmm. very occasional. That's by choice. 
But it was an emotional journey both times. So what, for the outgoing leaders watching this, yeah. what, what are the issues for outgoing leaders emotionally that they have to process? I think it's this idea of um, obscurity a little bit. <laughs> that, that can almost be um, a little bit firm in the way that, but we have to be comfortable with the level of obscurity. And I would even say um, for you, in your situation, it's one thing to be obscure if you have a church in this town and you're moving miles or hundreds or thousands of miles away to go live near your grandkids or something. To be a nobody. Like that. That's different. Mm, yeah. But when you stay in the town, when you stay in the church, um, even as a teaching pastor, like you have to think in advance about some guardrails. Like how are you going to support Jeff and not be a person that everybody else comes to for advice or to get the decision, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so I know you guys, you guys implemented some guardrails around that. Like you're not going to come to these meetings. And <laughs> if you get asked questions, you, you have to be really careful in those situations because it can feel like honor, like somebody really loves your opinion. Can I have your opinion on this? But actually a lot of those situations, if you're not prepared in advance, it yeah. can create a lack of clarity for people on who's actually making the decision and how do you get things done in those new seasons, right? You, you had a little anecdote. Yeah, yeah, I think Jeff and I were trying to figure that out. And I think he invited me because, you know, once I'm not the lead pastor, I operate by invitation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't get to make those decisions. He said, well, why don't you come to staff meeting? And I sat in, I think it was either staff or leadership team. And you know, I knew it was not my role to say anything. Right. So I sat there quietly for yeah. an hour and a half. And then afterwards, we both said, yeah, that didn't go well at all. Not that I said anything. I didn't say anything. But it's like, it is so not in my personality to remain silent. Yes. And then if you're sitting there, people are reading your body language going, is he agreeing with Jeff? Is he disagreeing with Jeff? Yeah. So we just decided, I don't need to go to those meetings yeah. anymore. And I'd go to some elders meetings, I think, but I don't think I've been to an elders meeting in three or four yeah. years. Like, yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's stuff like that. It is very hard. And a, a fun a fun moment, <laughs> mm -hmm. this was during COVID in 2021. So I had been off the regular teaching rotation for about six months. Mm -hmm. And the best advice I got on dealing with obscurity was from Gordon McDonald. And he was coaching me at the time, ordering a, uh, author of Ordering Your Private World. So Gordon, what can I learn from this? And this was off mic. He goes, Carrie, they forget you quickly. Mm -hmm. So I go to church one Sunday and we were still having to do registration, mm -hmm. like check-in. Yeah. And it was still probably a mask mandate or whatever. So I show up at church and I'd pre-registered to attend. And the volunteer standing there looked at me and said, what's your name? I'm like, oh, okay, all right. I said, Newhoff. They go down the list. They're like, Martin? I'm like, no, that's my dad. And what's your name? <laughs> Carrie. And everything inside me, I thought it was funny on the one hand, but there was a part of me that wanted to go, don't you know I founded this church? Right. Like right. Now, some of the other volunteers around them yeah. were cracking up. Yeah. And I think that person was pretty mortified to discover it. But you know what? That's it. That's yeah. life. Like, I'm not the guy anymore. And I never really was the guy. You're supposed mm -hmm. to be pointing beyond yourself to something greater. But yeah, it's like they forget you quickly. And Absolutely. now if I show up on stage occasionally once or twice a year, I have to be introduced as, <laughs> hey, a lot of you don't know this guy, but, yeah. and you know, that's a weird emotional journey, Sean. It is. I think it's a sign of health, but that doesn't mean it's easy, right? That no. doesn't mean it's easy. And so I guess what I would say is when I first started doing this work, I thought really the best thing for a church was for the outgoing lead pastor to leave. Hmm. And I still think hmm. having a little gap in there is helpful, sort of like a, a recalibration. Hmm. Um, and, and there's certain reasons for that where I would highly recommend it or mildly recommend it. So we can talk about that later if you want. But I used to feel pretty firmly, they should just leave. They should just unplug from the church. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think there are some cases where, unfortunately, that's probably still the best case. But here's what I've seen over time is I have been encouraged that some of the best transitions I have seen and been a part of have actually been when the outgoing lead pastor stays. Hmm. So I love saying that because it's true. It's not always a train wreck. <laughs> it's, it's not always a train wreck. But I have to say that they, it doesn't happen by accident. Mm. It's intentionality right. and focus. Right. And ultimately, when the outgoing leader stays a part of that church community, they do so with a lot of intentionality. They're very clear around other people to say, hey, I'm not here for you to complain 
about the latest leadership decision because this person is my pastor mm. and I'm 100% for them. Yeah. yeah, And they have to actively intervene and own that perspective because what I found over time is those people have such a pastoral heart for a church that in some way during a transition is going through a grieving mm -hmm. process. It's if, true. If you're an outgoing leader and people you love, maybe staff or members of your congregation are coming because they're struggling during this transition. They're, they're seeing some things that they love that are probably less mission and more method, but nonetheless, things they love about their church change. Um, if you don't actively intervene and support the current leadership, they often take your silence as affirmation. Mm -hmm. And that can then sort of bubble up in other ways. As affirmation or as... as so, so, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm clear. They see, so if I'm silent as the outgoing leader, yeah, they see that as affirmation or yeah. as condemnation? No, affirmation. Okay. So if I come and sort of mildly complain to you about something and you with, with a, a deep pastor. Oh, I see what you're saying. Got it, got it, got it. Sort of comfort me, but don't really say anything. Mm -hmm. I walk away going, yeah, I, I'm not happy about this and neither is the outgoing lead pastor who I just had the conversation with. And that, that can sort of fester versus for me to say, hey, something, and then for you to say, hey, I'm sorry you feel that way. Like right. I validate what it is you're feeling at the same point in time. I'm confident that the leaders of the church are doing the right thing. Right, to redirect that emotion. The redirect. I got it, I yeah. got it. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, if you were to prescript, if you were to prescribe a train wreck, in other words, Carrie, if you wanna make this a total disaster for Jeff, mm -hmm. or Rick Warren, if you mm -hmm. want to make this a total disaster for Andy Wood, yeah. or you know uh, Dave Stone, if you want to destroy mm -hmm. Kyle Eidelman's life, all yeah. of those situations, outgoing pastors, yep. destroying yep. incoming pastors' lives, what prescription would you give us? Insecurity. Really? Yeah. Just and be really insecure. Yep, yeah, just be insecure. Be the outgoing leader who so secretly wants to get the credit. Mm -hmm. And then subtly, the things you do, the body language maybe even, and the things you don't do, mm. um, it will undermine the current leaders. Like I know exceptional incoming leaders where the outgoing leader, because of their own insecurities, say things like when somebody complains to them, I say, well, I'm just not really sure that we should be doing things that differently. Like we shut down that campus recently and I thought that was a great initiative. And if you say something that you feel like is supportive, but what it actually is, is, is a backhanded compliment, you say something like, well, you know, that new leader person, blah, 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 they're just really young and mm -hmm. immature. And secretly what you're saying is, well, they're clearly not the leader I was, right? right? So you can feel like, well, you're, you're sort of for them, but actually what you've done is you've said, you don't know, you can't really trust this person because they're young, they're immature, they're new in decision-making. Yeah. What you have to do is actually set the bar higher for people and say, I trust that person fully and I'm in their corner. I'm sorry you feel that way. And you're right to feel that way because that's how you feel. And I want to affirm that, but I also want to challenge you to grow through this and support where this church is going because our mission is too important. Yeah. And then go back to the church's roots and say, you know, we might be doing that a little bit different now, but the roots of what we're pursuing with our mission are the same as they were 20 years ago when I got here and started leading. And that's the healthy side of pointing people back, right? It's not just pausing and giving a listening ear. It's not grumbling in some way where you secretly get the credit from a situation. So I think that's probably the number one thing is when a leader ultimately is not comfortable with insecure, or sorry, with obscurity, there's something insecure in them that still wants to get the spotlight or get the credit. Well, you had an interview on your podcast, Leaders in the Living Room, with Ashley Woolridge mm -hmm. and CCV, right? Yep. Did yeah. I get that right? Yes. Christ Church of the Valley, mm -hmm. and is that Arizona? It's, yeah, North Phoenix, Peoria. North Phoenix, yeah. okay. Uh, but there are a couple of mic drop moments for me. One yeah. is, why is the pastor the product? which I think is such a great yeah. question because yeah. I think that's a problem with the model, but mm -hmm. even in a small church, the pastor is the product and yeah. certainly in larger churches, the pastor is the product. Yep. Uh, but the other one that was even more so is he said, and why do so many outgoing pastors feel the need to stay? Because mm -hmm. he said, think about the corporate world. You never go into a Fortune 500 corporation mm -hmm. and meet the new CEO and he or she tells you, oh yeah, the old CEO is down the hall mm -hmm. working in marketing right now. Yeah. I mean, they're gone. Yeah. 
Now, it's weird because the church is who we are yeah. and it's what we do. Mm -hmm. And like, where else am I going to go? I didn't move, right? right. But right. it raises a really good question that we are kind of in weird territory in the church where Absolutely. leaders stay. Yeah. Uh, any other, if you were to write a couple of just, just a sort of rapid fire, but a couple of rules for outgoing pastors as how not to ruin your successor's future. Yeah. What's your advice to outgoing leaders? Yeah, I think there's some real practical things. So the first one is start early, like we talked about. The second one is uh, interview other outgoing lead pastors and understand the emotional journey and how they got healthy mm. on that. Because it's just not natural, right? Mm. It's just not natural. It's much easier just to leave. And if you're going to stick around, you really have to work on that. Leave and sulk or stay and sulk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah right. right. But I also think there's some practical things. Um, I know um, some some simple things. Like I know incoming leaders that have found nobody on staff's been given a cost of living adjustment or a raise in a decade. Mm. And so their entire staff is underpaid. And so this so, is before you go. Yeah. So that should have been dealt with before somebody left. And they shouldn't have inherited an underpaid staff and tried to right-size that budget. I know leaders, multiple leaders, unfortunately, who have inherited facilities problems that should have been dealt with. For instance, HVAC problems, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning problems that were seven figures or more that they had to pay out of budget within six months of taking the lead role because nothing had been repaired and maintained. A roof, again, three, four, five hundred thousand dollar roof replacement. So I think there's some real practical things that leaders can do to say, okay. What do I need to do personally? Mm. What do we need to do just practically with our budget? Um, I think a personal level of financial readiness. Um, we, we've talked about this before in other ways, but the outgoing lead pastor needs to get outside counsel. Don't go it alone on the personal financial front. You know, Five to 10 years before you're ready to depart, have wise counsel guiding you from a personal financial readiness perspective. Yeah. Um, that's a big burden for the incoming leader to try to solve. And what it does is it creates an issue where if there's any critical success factor for a transition is the health of the relationship between the incoming and the outgoing. Yeah. That is the critical factor. In fact, in my notes preparing for the course, I wrote down that it is one of the most critical factors. And I had about half a dozen incoming leaders from churches across America review my notes. And pretty much every single one of them called that out and said, Sean, it is not a factor. It is the factor. Do you as the outgoing leader unequivocally support the incoming leader? Yes. And just the overall health of their relationship. And so imagine a situation where the outgoing leader is financially dependent on the church and a job in the church that the incoming leader is sort of forced to say, your predecessor is going to be in this role. Mm. Their salary is going to be frozen. It's going to come out of next year's budget and the year after that and the year after that. It really handcuffs an incoming leader and strains potentially that relationship, mm -hmm. which is the critical element in succession. So some things like that really need to be resolved before succession before the actual transition so that the health of the incoming and outgoing lead pastor's relationship can be paramount because it is paramount. Yeah. What would you say to the leader who says, okay, I hear what you're saying. I'm the outgoing leader, mm -hmm. but I definitely have opinions on the direction of the church and mm -hmm. maybe it's not going hundred percent where I would take it. What is your advice? to that outgoing leader. So you're saying after the transition, after the, transition. the outgoing leader has developed that opinion. So uh, the first thing I would say is for the most part is um, you've handed that off. And part of making peace with the transition before it occurs is owning the fact that God is calling and ordaining a new leader. And every leader out there, whether you're a church planter or you were a transition leader when you stepped into that church, mm -hmm. um, you know that leadership involves being criticized. It involves, we, we've never seen a leader lead a group of people where everybody agreed all the time, mm -hmm. right? The truth is we all lead healthy marriages and we can go, well, we don't agree all the time, but we feel our marriage is strong. Yeah. Um, I remind leaders, I, I often ask them in situations where we're talking about something like this, is like, 
hey, did anybody do anything last week that they would do differently? And many people will raise their hand and go, oh yeah, there's a couple of things I did this morning. <laughs> and the truth is, what I say is, is, well, actually, then you don't even agree with yourself all the time. So why do you have to agree with your successor all the time? And so I think, one, you have to prepare for that. You have to prepare Understand to be supportive. Be yeah. yeah. And then I think if there are challenges, um, the one thing that really hurts an incoming leader is to know every time they see the outgoing leader or their predecessor that they have a criticism for them. So mm -hmm. I would tell you nine out of 10 times that you see that person, if not 99 out of 100, have an encouraging word. However, I do know several healthy transitions where once a year, the outgoing leader and the incoming leader have a private meeting where they sort of talk about areas of hurt or things that uh, the outgoing leader disagrees with. And what they do is they bookend the conversation of, of things I would disagree with mm -hmm. or I don't understand to this one meeting. And what that allows the incoming leader to do is to know the other 364 days a year, this person has my back. And when I see them, they're going to encourage me. They're going to put wind in my sails. But I'm a, I'm a practical person and I realize I'm leading differently than this person does. And I want to honor them by listening to their perspective. I don't, I'm not obliged to make changes because they recommend it but I want to honor them and listen to what they think. And so when you book in a conversation like that, I'm not saying this is for every leader, but I do know multiple churches that have set up a structure like that. And what that allows you to do is lead throughout the year with confidence, knowing this person has your back. And then it allows you to honor their opinion and sort of peel back the layers of the onion once a year and kind of go deep on a few things. So. That's really good. I mean, we're recording this months before it will air, Yeah, but you flew from Saddleback on I did. handoff Sunday yep. between Rick Warren and Andy Wood yep. and then flew to my place to do this project together, this course together. And you were sharing with me at dinner the other night or whenever mm -hmm. it was, this really poignant moment where Rick Warren, after mm -hmm. 42, years 42 years of leading Saddleback, publicly in front of tens of thousands of people said mm -hmm. to Andy, put his hand, his hand on Andy's shoulder and yeah. said, you're my pastor. That's right. Wow. Yeah. What, what does that take for an outgoing leader to do that? And then what does that feel like for a guy like Andy Wood or yeah. a person who's in that role? Yeah, well, that's funny because one of the things you and I didn't talk about is what Andy said after that. Uh -huh. and, and what Andy said, he turned to the audience because that was actually from the stage. Rick had done it before at dinner, yeah. but um, he turned to the audience and he said, can you imagine what that feels like to have Rick Warren turn to you and say, everybody, this is my pastor? <laughs> Um, and so it's profound, right? It is profound. Um, and Andy immediately feels uh, a weight of responsibility with that. But having walked that uh, entire journey with Andy, um, I know that he's confident in the calling. And so I think that's absolutely critical as Andy feels the weight of that and will continue to feel the weight of this transition for years, really. I think it most transitions genuinely take at least five years, if not five to seven. And so the clear calling that Andy feels to step into that role saying, this isn't my aspiration or my agenda. This is what God has called me to step into. I think that gives you the confidence to receive mm -hmm. something like that. And now what did it take for Rick? Uh, I think a couple things. Um, I, I even think Rick um, had to prepare in advance to say that. Because Rick is making a statement to Andy, but more importantly, I think Rick is making a statement to the church. Um, and he's making it very clear to the church that that transition of spiritual authority is now with Andy. And I'm a big fan of ceremony. And we talked about... Um, CEO transitions and right. now the old CEO at least. Well, in the military. So I just retired from 26 years, uh, most of it as a reservist in the Air Force. And we do change of commands usually about every two to three years. So we get good at them because every commander is changing every two to three years. Hmm. Um, and there are two elements to military transitions that always happen. One, there is a ceremony. The troops are in the audience 
And there is a flag that is passed from one leader to the next as a visual baton pass sort of indication. And this dates back for a long, long time in the military. So ultimately the troops would know who's giving orders on the battlefield, right? Hmm. But that ceremony sort of crystallizes what's happening and there's some real value to that. The other thing that always happens is the outgoing leader leaves. Hmm. So you see that in business and you see that in military. Um, and I would say it's super important and, and it's easier when the outgoing leader leaves. What's different in the church world is we're both team and family. And so yeah. when you're stepping out of this leadership role, you're really stepping off the, the team. But for many, many leaders, you're still a part of the family. Hmm. And I think that's really what allows somebody like Rick to say, you're now my pastor because Rick's saying, I'm stepping off this team for the first time ever in the history of this church. This church has never seen a succession because Rick planted that church in January of 1980. And he's clearly saying, I am now one of the family members of this church and I am under the spiritual authority. So it's actually a mark of brilliance on Rick's part mm -hmm. to say those words clearly and to do it in front of the church. Yeah, because it would be easier to say, Andy is my successor mm -hmm. than Andy is my pastor. Yeah. I think there's a big difference and Absolutely. it takes incredible humility. Mm -hmm. Having worshiped at Saddleback back in December, I did that interview with Rick in person mm -hmm. um, about succession, which we'll link to in the show notes. But yeah. you just realize the enormity of what God built, he built mm -hmm. over 42 years. And ironically, Andy was probably born around the year that Saddleback was started. Andy was born in 1981. So he oh, was after, actually just after. <laughs> Holy cow. So it's like, you've been leading this longer than I've been alive. That's, it was, that's exceptional. It was great. Uh, at the dinner before the ceremony, Andy's parents were there and Stacy's parents were there. And th they basically said, yeah, like you weren't even a, a twinkle in your parents' eye when this church was started. And so there was just this incredible moment of realizing like what God had already planned in advance to do here when this church started. These two people weren't even born. Mm -hmm. And yet here they are. So, ah, man, there's so much more we can talk about outgoing leaders. I've got 28 questions. Maybe we'll come back to them. We cover a lot in the course as well. But uh, so when you're like Andy Wood taking over for uh, Rick Warren or, say, Rich Velotis for mm -hmm. Pete Scazzaro or Kevin Queen, who came yeah. in after the founding pastor of Crosspoint wasn't around, Kyle Eidelman, third successor after Dave Stone at yep. Southeast, or even Jeff Brody, who took over for me at Connexus. Yeah. You know, the the phrase, and I, I think Jeff would say this publicly, is like, these feel like big shoes to fill, right? <laughs> yes, and yes. I mean, none perhaps bigger than Andy over at Saddleback. Yeah. But, you know, whoever replaces Craig Rochelle or Andy Stanley one day, mm -hmm. very, or so many, Bishop Jakes. Absolutely. Like, yep. name Furtick. Yep. Like, name it. That's going to be super, super challenging. Mm -hmm. Is that an impossible setup? Like, are you just setting yourself up to fail? I know some of those, like Kyle's been at it for a decade, Kevin yeah. for five years, Rich yeah. for probably six or seven now yeah. as a lead pastor. And mm -hmm. we've had conversations, I think, with, uh, well, I gotta have Kyle on at some point. I've yeah. had him on a long time ago, but yeah. have him back. But the whole element, like, is that an impossible situation? And what are the dynamics at play when there are big shoes to fill? Yeah. No, it is not an impossible situation. Um, the history, the 2000 year history of the church is a story of transition. Mm -hmm. And if we believe God is still doing a work through us in his church, then we have to believe in the health and growth of the movement of the local church. And it mm -hmm. looks different in different forms in different parts of the world, um, whether it's, it's two people in a house church or thousands of people in a giant auditorium or a stadium full, which we've seen on some big Sundays of churches. Um, it is absolutely not impossible. I think it is absolutely the most challenging season of leadership and probably also the most rewarding season mm. of leadership. I think those things go together. So I absolutely think that uh, leaders should be encouraged as they approach seasons of transition. I wonder, we haven't talked about this, but just you know, based on your several hundred people that you're working with um, or any other stats you have, there's probably more success stories than failure stories, are there, in succession? There, absolutely. And I oh. will say this. I think 
people always say, well, I see different successions out there and they don't seem to be going well. And what I would say is actually different. And I'm always a, a half full kind of person seeing things and, and seeing opportunity. Mm. I would say there's no transition I know of that's gone perfect. <laughs> yeah. And so if you choose to focus on the worst part of that transition in the worst moment, then you could probably say, oh, I don't know any transitions that are going great. Mm. But what's the expectation? Is it perfect? And I would say, no, there's a lot <laughs> that are going great. And I would wholeheartedly agree the vast majority of ones that I am a part of, there are seasons of burden for a leader to where many times they have to go, what did I get myself into? Mm. That's why the importance, again, of being called. If you can't rest on that in your toughest moments, if this is about you accomplishing something or a job or proving something to somebody, it's just not the right thing to say yes to. But if you're called, God will be there in those moments and you will make it through those moments and you will look back and see the fruit of people's lives and the fruit of a local church that um, really has an ordained path from your leadership. So calling tends to be, I think calling is confirmed in community, but it tends to be a very individualistic, subjective thing. I Absolutely. feel called to do this. And, and, uh, but I imagine that in addition to calling, I always think calling and gifting have to match. Mm -hmm. You know, like I may feel called to be a professional athlete. I don't have the gifting or the skill set to be a yes. pro athlete. I just don't, right? Yes. Um, I might be able to do a bike race. I might be able to run a marathon at some point, but I'm, I'm not going to make any professional team. Right. Is there a skill set or are there certain personalities or characteristics that tend to create great outcomes for incoming leaders? In other words, would you say there is a set of two or three essential qualities, mm -hmm. gifts, skills, characteristics that successful incoming leaders have? Yeah. Well, I do think that you, at that point, I, God can do anything. Sure, he can. And we have some stories of the Bible where people feel very ill-equipped and sort of the least of these from the least tribe and those types of things. And, it, and God really abides in those situations. So um, that being aside, I think before somebody steps into senior leadership of a church, you should have on your resume, quote, resume, um, or just your experiences, times where you have been a point leader, mm -hmm. meaning you have led something that required a team underneath you to lead. So you just weren't one person getting stuff done. Mm -hmm. You were assembling people underneath you who were going to lead others. So uh, the biblical term for that would probably be leader of 100. So if you're a leader of tens, you can kind of, be at the center of all that, like the hub and spoke. But for me to have a conversation with a leader who's feeling called this direction, I would actually say, I would love to hear stories of where you've led five to 10 other people on a team and they each all led five to 10 other mm -hmm. people. And that situation went well, that team was healthy. So when I say went well, what I mean was you met your performance objectives of whatever it is that you were doing? Was it a project with a defined start and end? Was it just a season of ministry, like leading a youth team or a campus pastor or those types of things? So it went well. You met your performance objectives. You see health on that team. And the third ingredient I would ask them to assess if, if I have a history of being a healthy point leader would be people on my team are more capable than me, but they still like being on my team. Wow. And if you have those ingredients, um, again, God can do anything, but I would say the makeup for leadership seems to be present. And if you're in your late 30s or 40s and you don't have any of those experiences, I would just pause and further ask deeper questions about, are you wired to carry the mantle of leadership? Because like Jethro advised to Moses, it's a heavy mantle and you need healthy team members and capable team members underneath you. And if you don't have a history of that, it's likely you won't do it well in the future at that senior level. Sort of that idea that, that uh, I remember talking to a previous guest, I think it might have been Michael McCain from McCain Foods. But okay. I couldn't get this wrong. And, you know, he's got 13,000 employees, $4.8 billion corporation. And he's talking about, 
you know, the qualities he looks for in young leaders. And I'm like, what do you do when there's no track record? And he goes, I look over, like, did they run for student council? Mm -hmm. Were, were they the quarterback on the football team? Mm -hmm. Did they take any initiative in the community? So past performance is the best indicator of future performance, yep. that kind of idea. So what are you leading? Even if it's a volunteer team. Absolutely. Now there's three, there's probably an infinite number of scenarios that incoming leaders can face, but in terms of trajectory <laughs> and momentum, yeah. uh, for, a church, there's sort of three scenarios I'm imagining in my yep. mind. A yep. declining church, mm -hmm. a plateaued or stagnant church, and a growing church. Yeah. What are the dynamics that an incoming leader faces mm -hmm. in each of the three scenarios? Yeah. So this, you know, the outgoing pastor stayed too long, you know, should have left five years ago, 10 years ago, things are not good. And those stories you hinted at earlier, like, mm -hmm debt that was not disclosed. Mm -hmm. We said we had 700 people, but the reality is yeah. we have, that was five years ago. Now we have 450 people left. Mm -hmm. So I've run into so many millennial leaders who are taking over going, I did not get the truth. Yeah. So declining church, yeah. stable church, growing church. What are the unique dynamics or characteristics that each presents for yeah. an incoming leader? Yeah, those, those are excellent questions. And so I think the first thing for listeners, if you're stepping toward a transition, this is a great thing for you to assess from the church and really say, where do I see this church? And then engage with the leadership of the church and make sure mm. they agree. Because if you think this church is in one sector and they think they're in another, you're going to have very dissimilar sides of seeing future need for change. Um, so it's a great thing early on. Now, uh, we'll just take them in that order. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think the easiest, most often, the easiest church to step into leadership is a church with obvious decline. Mm -hmm. And the reason Funny. why is everybody knows they're in decline. <laughs> so they are more amenable to potential change. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be sort of the best part about that is people are more likely to agree. Now, the worst part about that is what's causing the decline is likely still a part of the church. It's embedded mm. in who they are, how they think, and their culture. It wasn't just the outgoing leader. Correct. Mm. Yeah. So some things are going to be easier in agreeing for the need for change, maybe even the speed of change. Um, but the roots of all those things embedded in who they are as a church, um, how they make decisions, how they think, those types of things are probably still going to need to be tackled. And those are the types of things that take years. So okay. that would be the declining. The plateaued would probably be the most challenging because yeah. um, I think what I said earlier is the history of the church is a history of transition. And if you look back at the turning points of churches and you say, when did we make strategic turning points? There will be a lot of things that churches will say, well, that was a turning point for us. But the one that always results in a turning point for better or for worse is the change of a senior leadership. Every church mm -hmm. will look back at their history and say, that's when pastor so-and-so left and we, we, you know, appointed this person. So those are turning points of opportunity. And in a plateaued church, the challenge can be every succession transition is an opportunity. But if the church feels that the leadership changes that are pending or necessary for really a new life cycle of the church to begin, if they feel they're unnecessary, they can mm -hmm. sort of bolt themselves down to the status quo and go, the budget's fine. We got money in the bank. The room looks full. At least we're not declining. Yep. Yep. So that's where like a Simon Sinek start with why. You really have to go back and say, is there an, do people understand the need for change? Don't just implement change, but help them understand why there is a need for change. And that can be more challenging there. And then the third would be accelerating. And that can often be really, really amazing. Because if you think about, uh, not a lot of people drive manual transmission cars anymore, but if you have a manual transition and uh, transmission and you have driven up a hill, you know if you're going, let's say, from second gear to third gear up a hill, you don't just go from your average speed in second gear and shift into third gear because as you press in the clutch and disengage hmm. the flywheel and the transmission, you lose momentum for a moment. 
And then you shift into third and then begin to let the clutch out and go into that third gear. So if, if that's a metaphor for second gear, third gear, for a leadership transition, having momentum, accelerating out of second gear, pushing the car forward, then shifting into third is the best way hmm. to shift gears as you're climbing a hill. But it can also present challenges because if everything is growing, that can be, um, Toby Mack has a song called um, something about if you want to steal the show, mm. um, there's a line in there. And what that is a metaphor for is you're the main act, but somebody who was doing one of your opening sessions, like a, a less known band, they played such an amazing show. You walk out there and you can't compete with those who have gone before you. And you speak a lot, travel and speak. You've mm -hmm. probably followed some speakers where you're oh, like, yeah. what? <laughs> like this person oh, yeah. got the first standing ovation at this conference ever, and now I have to go after. And that can pre present some challenges where um, the culture and the congregation that can kind of feel like, well, our best days are behind us. Mm -hmm. And that can be a challenge for a new leader. Wow. If there are qualities like for a leader, an incoming leader, younger leader heading into a declining church, plateaued church, mm -hmm. or growing church, single word, adjective. Yeah. What What is the quality or characteristic that mm -hmm. you think is most needed in each situation? Patience. Patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, patience. I think leaders stepping into those situations um, often are younger than the average age of the congregation. Mm -hmm. They're stepping in. Uh, almost every transitions leader is a first-time lead pastor. Right. Um, Andy Wood would be an example of somebody who's not. He planted a church, mm -hmm. and now he's transitioning into a church, but he's been a lead pastor before. So not every pastor in transition is a first-time, but about 95% are. So there's a sense from these younger leaders of this is my season. Like, I am so excited for how God's going to use me and our family. You might be packing up and moving across the country and planting yourself into a new community and the sky's the limit. And the truth is, you're going to have to step into this next season and lead at the pace of the church where you're going. And it's hmm. often a much slower pace than what you have because you've got this moment, you've got this, this season of adrenaline and push. But we all know when you're leading, if you're going so fast that nobody's following, you're not leading. <laughs> and so the response of the church and the ability even to respond to leadership is absolutely critical. And I think patience is really required. And what do you do with that season of patience is you invest it relationally. You invest it relationally into your staff, into your, your elder board, and into key influencers around the church, your top volunteers, your top givers, and begin to really see the church and the ministry through their eyes. It's a very diagnostic season of trying to understand the church through the perspective of people. Through the cohorts you lead, you're seeing patterns now with incoming leaders. What is typically the hardest season for an incoming leader? Is it that initial six months or year? Mm -hmm. Does it happen two years in? When when does the, 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 you know, when does it get the darkest? When does it get the hardest for many incoming leaders? Yeah. On average, year three is synonymous with Sam Chan's terminology, leadership pain. Hmm. Uh, if you're a transitions leader, you need to pick that book up we can talk about that in a different uh, conversation. But what tends to happen is when you get there, there's a lot of euphoria. It can be a beautiful season, typically called the honeymoon season. Right. And you're excited and the church is excited, but it turns out that the church is sort of naively excited. They're excited about their own thoughts and ideas of how you will lead but they don't know you yet. And so it turns out that's just not based on reality. Yeah. And so the honeymoon season sort of comes to an end when you begin to make deeper changes, not only just adding new things toward the future, but you begin to shut down things, right? Turning the tap off of something that has been a part of the ministry because people tend to have a drift away from the mission and toward the method, right? 
toward the plans and programs that are a part of the ministry. And if those things change or even are halted in some way, that presents a tremendous challenge. And so generally speaking, the honeymoon lasts about a year. Hmm. And then it's year two when some of these changes begin. And the first couple are typically observed by people, but as future change sets in throughout year two, people realize, oh, that's different. I don't know if I like that. There's a little bit of a who moved my cheese, right? And we would hope that everybody was so spiritually mature that they would just go, if this is what God's got in store for our church, we love the mission and who we're going to reach through these changes, we're on board. But the truth is we're all human. There's a little bit of us in us. And sometimes that creates friction. And so about year three is when you see former elders get upset and leave the Mm -hmm. church, former small group leaders, maybe former staff members and things like that. And that season as any leader, I always say, hey, it's not about you. Don't take this personally. But the truth is everything's a little bit personal in life Mm -hmm. and everything's a little bit personal in leadership. And it's really hard in year three not to take that personal um, and just to remain on task. And it's usually the end of year three where people start to see more fruit of the future ministry and the present changes Mm -hmm. and the sting of the past changes that maybe saw some decline in church attendance, decline in church giving, or just some friends and family leave the church, the sting of that starts to fade. So year three is typically known as the the year of leadership pain in transition. What are some hidden landmines? Things that most incoming leaders, outgoing leaders, or even congregations wouldn't expect when it comes to succession? Yeah, I think some of the hidden landmines are probably uh, just going too fast initially. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about, you need to learn how to go slow. I think for incoming leaders, they often go from what was their past ministry, doesn't even have to be senior leadership, into this new role without any rest. Mm -hmm. And most of them get three to six months into their new role and realize that they really needed to invest relationally into their family. They really needed um, some quiet time, some time of reflection. And I'm not talking about a day or two. I'm talking about probably a 30-day sabbatical would be the minimum. of Take some family vacation, invest in your family, take some time off, maybe just with your spouse, and take some time off to be alone and be fully recharged. You don't want to start a race with a half-charged battery. So a sabbatical before you take on the role? Yeah, I would highly recommend Mm -hmm. if you're offering a lead pastor a job at your church, that you give that person a 30-day funded sabbatical before they start their first day. And the truth is, most people are moving, they're buying a house, they're dealing with movers, they don't have electricity turned on, they don't have plumbing turned on. This is a season that just becomes naturally more stressful. And so as much as you can do to care for that family in transition, as much as you can do to take care of those things for them, and give them the time to get situated and build really a firm foundation, the relationships of that family, the peacefulness of their spiritual walk versus the turmoil. Because when we're busy, we're reactionary. And the last thing you want is day one, a reactionary leader taking over at your church. Yeah. Anything else you want to share with leaders before we wrap up? Yeah. I think the last thing that I would say is don't do this alone. We do cohorts at the Ascent Leader. It's one of the most important things that I think people do is to get them in peer relationship. But regardless of where you're at or what you're capable of doing on a leadership development spectrum, find people who are for you, find people who you can trust, find people who understand you and leadership dynamics and create some peer relationships where you can be in conversation about leadership. Um, It's not always your team, your staff team. It's not always your board where you can have every conversation that you need. Sometimes that neutral ground of peer-to-peer connections, maybe access to some mentorship um, and some coaching 
is the absolute best way that you can sort of stay in the long game. And actually, Warren Bird just released some research that said regular peer-to-peer connection for leaders is the number one issue in sustainable leadership. Wow. And so I would just encourage everybody, invest yourself consciously into some of those relationships that are around you. If people want to join one of your cohorts, what's Mm -hmm. the website that they can apply at? Yeah, it's just theascentleader.org. Okay, great. And then let's talk about the course that you and I put together, which is mostly you. I got to I got to play, uh, give some, you know, do a few sessions and chip in here and there. Um, what are some of the issues that you cover? Obviously, this was just, you know, an hour broad strokes of some of the dynamics, yeah. but you go into yeah. board. You got a unit on salary negotiation? How, how did that go? <laughs> Yeah. So it's so interesting. That wasn't an original part of the course, but as we began to think, and and I think it even came out in a conversation where you and I were were on together as a phone call or Zoom call, and I just started to reflect on certain issues that um, impact the success of a lead pastor. And there are certain things in church world I think we do pretty poorly. And I do think there's this culture of asceticism in the church where it's like, well, you're in ministry, you should just accept the salary that you're offered and then just plug away and trust God. And (laughs) And secretly resent it two years in. Yes, and resent it or have family members that resent it. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is scripture actually says that you're worth your wages. And so, well, what does that mean? Well, when we enter that conversation in the church, being worth your wage, there's a lot of opinions on the table about what that means for the size and complexity of a church. It differs. A church of 300 in middle America in a rural environment versus an urban versus maybe on the West Coast or East Coast in an urban environment. And so the truth is, is that we need a lot of facts. And facts are the only way that we can engage with opinions that are maybe incorrect. And it turns out that pastors just traditionally are not great at salary negotiations. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, one of the things that I think we can best do to serve the church is to help these leaders step into a sustainable ministry. And a big Mm -hmm. part of that is the financial income. It's also benefits and things like that. We cover some of those things. But Ultimately, that's a key issue in this pastor, this family, planting themselves here and being able to have a long run that they can pour themselves out into. So we sort of go through the timeline of how do you know if you're called? Mm. When you feel called, how do you negotiate your salary? What are some early things that can help you understand your fit and the church? And is that a fit? And then we sort of go into the steps of leadership and we cover... I would say about 60 to 70% is for the incoming lead pastor. Another 20% is for the outgoing lead pastor. And then there's another maybe 10 to 15% that is what we call bridge leaders. And it helps the board understand all the dynamics of what's going on in this season and key staff and volunteers that are invested in the leadership circle and the decision-making circle understand how they can play an important role both before, during, and after the transition. So the course was designed for uh, outgoing, incoming, and also leaders, that is, and then also board members and key leaders. So. It's available at theartofpastoralsuccession.com and through the Art of Leadership Academy, as always. Sean, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you opening up what you've learned over the last decade. And I think there are great days ahead for the church and for succession. I know I have learned so much from you. Thanks so much for being with us. So good to be here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. There's a new movement happening in the country to reclaim the promise of Jesus' unconditional love and grace, and to see his church rise above the culture war. He gets us, hopes to give it a voice. The biggest faith campaign in history, He Gets Us invites a rapidly growing audience, from spiritual explorers to like-minded Christians, to reconsider the radical life of Jesus. Whether people believe Jesus was God or just a man, they're invited to consider his example for themselves.